Hey Colin. Hello again. <laughs> Hello again. Yeah. The coronavirus did not stop you from having and spending a holidays here in Slovenia. No, no. Um, I was quite lucky on that one because we booked the ferry on um, Sunday um, and the previous Thursday it was announced that um, England was green and it was safe to travel. When we return, because we have to travel through France, then we have to isolate for two weeks when we get home. But mm. um, I'll be glad I need a break after this holiday. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we've been here over a month now, and but it's been fantastic. And, you know, right. We've got lots of friends here. We know you as a stubborn activist, prosecuted three times in almost three decades, but you continued all the time. Do you still have a will to fight for cannabis laws to repeal? Yes, yes, it's um, unfortunately it's not something that I, I really wanted to do. It's um, more of a calling, you know. Um, there's an unjust law there, and there's a medicine that can help, a plant that can help thousands of people, millions of people. In fact, the whole population of the world could benefit from that's been made illegal. Um, and yeah, I will continue to fight for people's right to, you know, grow their own medicines. You know, we don't need anybody else really. We just need to stand up and get this law abolished and um, repealed the law that needs to be repealed. Mm -hmm. It's as simple as that. And that would allow um, freedom. People could um, provide for themselves or industries like um, s smaller farmers could grow and help their communities. The last interview you were announcing kind of a hemp revolution in Manchester and also you wanted that decriminalization would uh, happen yeah. in Manchester. So uh, afterwards what was happening? Um, well of course this, um, this Covid thing came around and um, all protesting would um, you know there was no nothing anybody could do you couldn't have meetings even um, regarding things and all the um, politicians and everything they're all using this covid as an excuse to push other things into the long grass so um, now that things like can, everywhere <laughs> yeah um, however when i get back um, i will be contacting um, some of the Manchester councillors, Andy Burnham, and putting it to him regarding this um, again, because obviously um, lots of businesses have uh, lost lots of money, so the council have lost lots of money. I mean, the whole country's lost a lot of money. So now would be uh, there'd be no better time than um, to start a project for growing hemp and cannabis and. We would have thousands of jobs, and a whole, a whole new revolution could start from then, which would be like the hemp revolution. I mean, Manchester was responsible for the industrial revolution, and now the time has come to stand up as um, Mancunians and get behind this, and let's create jobs. And if Andy Burnham can show me a good way, a, a good reason why not to do this. Well, I'm more than willing to listen to him, but he also has to listen to my side of the argument. And I'm going to be pressing him on this when I get home. I'll keep you posted on that. Yeah, thank you. So first uh, Brexit and then uh, coronavirus. That's oh, yeah. quite shocking, yeah. right? And uh, well, What a start to the year, eh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm wondering, is Brexit somehow impacting uh, the UK cannabis laws or not? What is um, the current situation? Well, uh, yeah, well recently <clears throat> what happened in um, 2018, November I think it was 2018, the government um, reclassified uh, cannabis and made, it was to try and make it available for doctors to prescribe. Um, it was a bit of a, uh, a half thought out plan really. Um, and as to date, I think there's been roughly um, 20 prescriptions in two years for this. Um, 
the system, the way it works is, um, it's, and you have to be a private patient. You can't get this on the what's the National Health Service. Um, so it involves um, telephoning uh, one of probably half a dozen private companies that have set up in the UK to supply cannabis and it seems to be that you pay £250, about, about €300 Euros for an interview um, and then after the interview you can be supplied cannabis in the form of buds which normally comes from Red Rocken in Holland or some other suppliers that's been irradiated and it's probably about 15% THC and that will cost you um, 300, well, in the first instance it costs you I think 600 pounds for 28 grams for the first month and then after that it will cost you 400 pounds a month for 28 grams. Um, there are other things that they supply, um, maybe some tinctures and things and they work out quite expensive compared to you can buy similar products in the in the shops um, yeah. and that so now if you've got the money you can get the cannabis on a prescription and if you've got the prescription if you've paid the money and got the prescription then this piece the piece of paper you get as a prescription makes you a legal cannabis consumer yeah so if you, you can't be arrested then mm. for consuming cannabis because you've got a prescription for it. Mm. But if the person next to you has not got the money to £600 to buy the prescription and the cannabis in the first place, he can be arrested and put in jail. Mm. I mean, how, what sort of a crazy system is that? Yeah. If you've got the money, you can have the it's, it's like everything in life. So what's then the difference between uh, black market where you have to pay a lot of money for cannabis and uh, let's say this commercial market or... Yeah, well, we've, we've actually, we've got like a, a, three, a three tier, a three step system. Um, we have, uh, the, the best market is the green market. Now the green market is either you produce it for yourself or you have friends that can, you can get it off of maybe to just help with the cost of the growing um, and that's all a nice friendly market, the green market and then in the middle we've got the, the so-called black market where you're buying cannabis of an unknown quality from somebody on a street corner or something you know at the worst or I mean the, there is there's also part of the black market there's a lot of good people out there as well you know but they've all got to make a living off it you know they they are there and I'm not saying that all black market is bad you know because if you pay the money it's about say 160 between 160 and 200 pounds for 28 grams um, I consider those people there's also but we've got vendors yeah vendors are like trusted people that you can go to for cannabis you know okay you've got to pay between 160 and 200 pounds for it but there are good people out there that do this and you know and they get decent cannabis and if they don't have any rubbish cannabis you mm -hmm. know they make sure that the products that you're getting is good um, that's the way the system sort of always worked in England they're like um, I mean no, with the weed dealers basically you know they just deal weed they don't deal um, amphetamines or anything else other than the weed um, and they're quite you know there's a lot of reputable people who does that in England and at the very top we've got the I call it the pharma cannabinoid market um, now the pharma cannabinoid market is sort of run on the same as the pharmaceutical industry and you've got this group of um, rich investors and they're all looking at cornering the market in England for cannabis on prescription by the NHS and they're probably they're probably half a dozen of them at the moment and it's like England is being circled by these companies and just all trying to wait for the government to say yes okay you can start to prescribe cannabis but if people think that they're going to get 
an ounce of 28 grams of cannabis on the National Health Service. Um, I think it's like living in a fantasy land because there would be probably 20 million people in England would be entitled to some sort of medical cannabis prescription or other and the system just couldn't cope with it. It would be impossible, you know, but they're still looking for it and they're looking at making billions out of this um, cannabis plant. Yeah. You know, it's ridiculous. The luckiest you are if you find yourself on the green market. Yes, yes. If you can find a find somebody <laughs> on the yeah. green market, you're in the best place. And if you look into um, activists and people that are looking on the medical side of cannabis, you'll always find the answers. The answers are there. Um, we don't need the pharma cannabinoid mafia taking over, you know. That doesn't need to happen. People just need to stand up and the governments need to rescind the law and then it will be a fairer market because hobby people who are hobby gardeners at the moment that grow cannabis, they could, you know, grow specific cannabis and they could employ people. Um, if the industry then was able to develop as a free market and then it would just be like growing tomatoes. If you grow good tomatoes, you're going to sell more. If you grow bad tomatoes, nobody wants them, you see. So that's the way that the market would actually stabilise itself. We'd have lots of um, small growers um, growing different types of plants and it could all be just for the cost. And that's, you know, okay, everybody makes a little out of it because we've all got to eat at the end of the day, but it would bring the prices down. I mean, with the prices, it would probably be 25 euros for 28 grams, you know, yeah. a, a euro a gram. I mean, that would be the, the real aim for the thing. And as That's you happened said, in Uruguay, it's a dollar a gram. And as you said, the consultations, people always get free from activists and they have to pay very expensively to the doctor as a... That's right, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, when I go home after this holiday, uh, recharge my batteries, um, I have uh, was going to do the same as these other companies are doing. Um, and the way that that would work is, when I, in um, 1995, when I was prosecuted for having the Medical Marijuana Cooperative, the way we used to work it then was, um, I would send them um, a letter and saying that for their doctor to sign to say that their patient was suffering from whatever the disease or condition was most of the time it was for multiple sclerosis and he knew of no contraindicators as to why his patient shouldn't use cannabis and he'd sign that and then when I get that back from the doctor then we can look at what the patient needs you know, it, it might be somebody who needs just a tincture, you know, it's not all about smoking cannabis when it's on the medical. Um, people with cancers and so, some other illnesses, they need suppositories and they need suppositories of different strengths. So the tinctures and suppositories are the answers to uh, carnacopia, a vast amount of illnesses and conditions in people. You said the sativex is very expensive while at home can be produced for... Mm. Well, yeah, for instance, for instance, Sativex, which is one of the only worldwide licensed THC and CBD tincture in um, a 10 mil will cost uh, around about 220 pounds, two, two, four, 30, 40 euros and you can make the same thing for about 20 euros and you know uh, you could the one that you would make for 20 euros though it would it would be made with love you know and made the correct way it wouldn't have been have to go through all the machinery and everything and then come out and all be this that and the other and oh in the end it won't have, you know it's 20 euros a bottle and not 220 euros and the extra 200 euros it's not going it's not in the medicine that's in the 
investors' pockets and the people behind it. That's where the money goes because if you look at the product's worth, you know, if we were to do this on a large scale, we could bring the price down to five euros. It's all dependent on, you know, what we do and there's a lots of farmland out there that farmers could, you know, it grows quite easily hemp and they've got the land and industry would do it all itself, it would create a whole new industry. Has uh, cannabis consumption increased or decreased due to the virus now? What do you think? Well, I think it has increased um, because people have been uh, off work and things and people are looking for different ways to relax and also with the um, edibles market now the edibles market with um, chocolate and gummy bears and all sorts of things that's really taking off in England um, again that's in a, a grey area it's sort of the, the grey black market <laughs> yeah um, but the, lots yeah, of colours for yeah, markets. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the consumption of that has, um, has certainly gone up from what I know. Um, and that again is unregulated, you see. And this is one of the problems that we have at the moment with the law. There can be no regulation at all, it's all illegal. Um, and it all goes on. In Manchester, um, I think when I did the figures, it was about three and a half metric tons of cannabis smoked every week when when there is no law this is happening you know mm -hmm. and how many people does it take to produce three and a half tons of cannabis and how many people does it take to distribute it and to smoke it so there's a lot of people already you know doing this and even though it is illegal and during the um, this um, isolation period the police have been finding lots of groves Lots of cannabis grows in England. They've been busting a lot of people because obviously um, they can see people coming and going because there's not many people on the streets. And, but when they're taking these crops down and they're saying, oh, we've got a thousand plants we've just found, and then they just dump them, you know? It's absolutely crazy. All that stuff that could be helping people. You know. Exactly the same happening in Slovenia. Beautiful crops of yeah. very healthy cannabis uh, mm. plants. They just destroy them. All public events, conferences, fairs, lectures are being cancelled uh, mostly. How this affects uh, cannabis activism right now? Yeah, it's affected the activism. Um, although the social media keeps things quite alive. Um, it's also helped in a way because a lot of these big um, pharma cannabinoid companies they all had big seminars to be going around Europe and now they're not, they're all that stopped so they're not spreading their um, pharma cannabinoid news and they can't get their investors at the moment um, I'm sure they will though uh, I'm sure they will but there's a lot of people they're going to get burned by this because when the people realise they can do it at a fraction of the cost and they can get it today instead of waiting three months I mean in England they're looking at they're not accepting any of peer-reviewed evidence they don't accept peer-reviewed evidence they'll need to um, do three-year trials on every condition um, and they'll have to be double-blind placebo trials and that's going to take a lot of money to do these trials so the big pharma cannabinoid companies they're all going to have to have deep pockets because they think that they're just going to be able to have this carte blanche you know the freedom for it in England and that's not going to happen it just won't happen because if it does happen it would bankrupt the National Health Service within a week because you know they've already got no money you know they've not been coping with, they've coped with the coronavirus. I mean, they built a hospital um, that never had any patients in, um, and it cost them three million pounds to dismantle it, to take it down, you know. Wow. Crazy things are happening. Yeah. <laughs> also, human rights are right now subject to the virus. Um, in the name of the virus, anything can be prohibited. Well, we're in uh, August now, and this has been going on since probably 
in England from March. Um, so people are starting to wake up, you know, and realize that the, this Chinese virus is not so dangerous. And I think there's been some big fake news in the beginning and it's all been spun out of proportion. And I know in England that they said that there were 40,000 people died. Um, but this time of the year, over the winter, I think it was less than was died the year before of flu and natural causes and things. I mean, if you get in England, it was it was since the figures was so twisted that if you got run over by a bus um, and you died there, when you got to hospital, they put it down as it was another coronavirus patient. Of course, because they got uh, the financial subsidy. Yeah, if it was Corona, I don't think you had to pay for the funeral. You couldn't go to the funeral. Mm. And they just disappeared, you know. I put the blinkers on and I ignore all this stuff. And because um, people don't stop coming to me and asking me, you know, I get lots of people every week with problems with cancer and young children with epilepsy and things and I have to just concentrate on that side and keep things as calm as we can and then watch everything else around you um, but I mean I don't like the fake mask thing you know that's crazy because that's going to do you more damage than anything <laughs> um, and the washing I'm really concerned about everything like that I'm not going to be washing my hands every two minutes and things because what we're doing is we're desensitizing our bodies to germs. You know, we need we need germs and making ourselves sterile, our bodies' um, natural functions they're not working. You know, um, things are slowing down, and in the end, you don't need your immune system. So then, when your immune system becomes low, then you will become ill. So. Oh, it's it's very uh, very worrying that I'm seeing people being ultra clean, too clean. You know, you go in the house, it smells like the swimming pool, and it's like, oh, take your shoes off, and oh no, stay away from me, and everything. It's yeah. not going to cope when a germ is. A fly will kill people in the end. So Israelis have been doing some studies with cannabis to um, stop the coronavirus. You know. Um, and yeah, I believe, you know, maybe um, an oral spray with THC and CBD in it, you know, that's gonna, that, I would imagine that that would kill it off. I mean, I've not felt ill. I have, I take um, a one-to-one -one THC CBD three, drops three, four times a day. Um, and that, um, energizes that energizes your endocannabinoid system and balances everything out and that way okay if you get some germs it, that at might, least you're more resistant to I think so everything, yeah. Yeah. yeah and I think that well I know that there is a plant out there for every illness you know it's not just about cannabis um, and the pharmaceutical companies, the pharma mafia as I call them, they've suppressed all this evidence. Most of the concoctions that they have now are originally from plants, you know, for headaches and stuff. Elm, bark, they use that, but then instead of using elm bark, oh, we'll make a synthetic version. And that's what their, their products are. They're basically synthetic chemicals that are mimicking plant matter. Why would we use and the fake things and yet, that don't belong to right. the biological yeah. system as that's Dr. Hornby yeah. We're organic, <laughs> we're an organic entity and we don't need to put synthetic material because it's not going to do us any good. Yeah. Yeah. Colin, continue your good work. Yeah. See you soon, hopefully. Yeah. Yeah, great, and uh, see you soon.